Let's get our Bibles open to Acts the 10th chapter, and we will be looking at the 10th and 11th chapters today. If you, in fact, you want to put a marker there, that would be very appropriate because that will be the bulk of our study. I want to join with Ron in saying it is good to be here. We appreciate the presence of all that are here. We appreciate those who are watching, listening online, and want to get into the lesson as quickly as I can, but a couple of quick announcements. Uh, let's also remember Bobby White, uh, Christy's dad, who will be having surgery tomorrow, um, and uh, actually known Brother Bobby longer, and I've known Aaron and Christy. Uh, met him years ago when I was in a meeting out at uh, Beulah in Limestone County, no longer a group that meets, but let's remember him and his surgery. And I want to just say a quick word about Sister Khan and her passing. I, I don't know. I've not kept statistics on it. I know saints pass away all seven days of the week. But it does seem to me like, just in my mind, that a bigger percentage fall on a Sunday. And that seems like an odd, and yet Sunday is the Lord's Day, the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. And if there ever was an, an appropriate day for a saint to pass away, it's on that day that reminds us of the victory. And I thought our brother Eric said it so well. We certainly mourn that passing. And we, we grieve with the Khan family. And yet, there is a joy that is mingled with that. A joy in thinking about the reward that comes to the faithful. And, you know, Sunday is a day of victory for the Christian. And I, we never ought to forget that. And the fact that one has passed away on this day, yes, it brings a measure of sadness. But in another way, it's just an gr even greater reminder of that victory that awaits us all. Let's turn to Acts 10 as we conclude our look at the conversion of Cornelius. Um, the book of Acts, I've said, what a great book it is. And there are just so many significant chapters in it. Uh, you know, you kind of, you mark them as all the books important, but certain ones you know, are decisive turning points or great events. What happens in chapter 10, and then as it carries over into 11, is a significant turning point in this book. Jesus had said the gospel was to go to every creature. They were to make disciples of all the nations. But to this point, they've not been going to all nations. That great Pentecost when 3,000 are baptized, they were all Jews and proselytes to the Jewish religion. The closest they've come to reaching out is in the 8th chapter when the gospel began to go to Samaria. And yet even the Samaritans that the Jews often looked down upon, they had been circumcised, they kept the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law of Moses, you know, the Jews sometimes were critical of the way they kept it, but they, they were not Gentiles. Well now, here Peter has gone to the house of Cornelius at God's instruction, and he is preaching the gospel to Gentiles. And we've been talking about that and, you know, what a great and significant change this is. You know, he doesn't go there to say, if you will become a proselyte to the Jewish faith, then you can become a Christian. He said, you can become a child of God as a Gentile. Well, he is preaching there, and I want to pick up with the sermon, which we've looked at a lot. But chapter 11, Peter had said, I was told by an angel to go um, and preach the words by which, now he's saying Cornelius told me this, by which you and your household will be saved. So he went to preach the words of salvation. Well, what does he preach? Well, 
begin at verse 34, and I want a, a tenth chapter. I just want to pick up a few th thoughts here. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. He says Jesus is Lord. Jesus is judge. Jesus is the one that brings forgiveness of sins. In reality, the sermon that is recorded here is not that different than anything else he's preached with the exception of the part about for all. You know, he adds that phrase several times in there. But he's preaching the same Jesus he's been preaching everywhere else. Lord, Judge, Savior. But what happens then is completely different than anything that's ever happened before. The sermon gets interrupted by God. By God sending his spirit. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. This great interruption takes place. And I want you to look in the 11th chapter. Peter is back in Jerusalem now and he's recounting the story. And look at how he describes it there. Verse 15. And as I began to speak. Now, Peter's sermon wasn't finished when this happened. That's why I use the word interrupted. He had more he was planning to say. But as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When you see this sermon interrupted, the Holy Spirit coming, you see them speaking in tongues, magnifying God, it has to make you think back to Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come and they were all gathered in one place and I think they, there is the apostles, there, suddenly there came from a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 11, after he has talked about the people of various places, he said, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So Acts 2, the Spirit comes on the apostles. They speak in different languages. And that's what's made clear that those are languages people can understand. And they spoke of the mighty works of God. Here in the 10th chapter, the Holy Spirit comes. And Cornelius and those with him, they begin to speak in these languages. And they magnify God. There's some great similarities. And yet, 
there is also something very, very different about this. Think about what happens on Pentecost. On Pentecost, the Spirit came upon those who were going to speak that day, and His coming was a major role in bringing together a crowd. You know, there were a sound like the rushing mighty wind, there were tongues like fire. These men are speaking in languages that they didn't know, and people are understanding them, and it brings a crowd together. At the house of Cornelius, you've got a crowd that's already gathered. And the Holy Spirit on this occasion doesn't fall on the one that's going to do the speaking. It falls on the crowd that's already assembled. So, great similarities, but also a very stark difference. And that suggests that, well, maybe the Spirit came for a different purpose in Acts 10 than in Acts 8. And I want us to think about that for a moment. And I want to think about it as I believe it is often misused. There are those who will seize upon this and say, the Holy Spirit came on these people before they were baptized in water. Therefore, they must have been saved prior to baptism. Well, that's a big jump. Nowhere else do you see baptism coming placed before baptism. Jesus in Mark 16, 16 places it afterwards. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. On Pentecost, the day we've been referencing, when they were cut to the heart, it said in verse 37, and said, what shall we do? What's the answer? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They had to be baptized to be saved. We've talked often of the conversion of, of Paul, at the time called Saul. And he told of how that Ananias came to him three days after he had seen the Lord in a vision and said in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Still in his sins. He had to arise and be baptized. Romans 6, 3 and 4 talks about baptism as key to entering into the relationship with Christ. That we are baptized into Christ. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, you are sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3 and following. How does one get into Christ? The scripture is consistent in saying that one is baptized into Christ, baptized into his death. You know, it would be really good if we would go to Acts 10 and just let the apostle tell us what this outpouring of the Holy Spirit meant, what its purpose was. Was its purpose to show they were saved, they don't need to be baptized? Well, let, let's go back again and read verse 44 beginning. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone doubt the salvation of these folks who have received the Holy Spirit? Now if you're reading along with me, you're going, He's either gone blind or he's lost his mind. And the reality is both are happening, but still... Look at the verse. What did he actually say? Can anyone forbid water 
that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. What did Peter draw from it? He drew from it that there is no way in this world that you're going to forbid these people to be baptized. Yes, they are Gentiles. You're not going to stop this. When he gets back to Jerusalem, he's questioned about his conduct. He's explaining it. Verse 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could withstand God? I want you to look carefully and compare verse 47, 48 of chapter 10 with what he says in verse 17. As it's happening, he says, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who received the Holy Spirit? When he's recounting the story, he said, I wasn't going to withstand God since these people had received the Holy Spirit. How could he have withstood God? Verse 17. If he had refused baptism to these people, if he had refused, if he had not offered to them the same terms of salvation he had offered unto the Gentiles. For 2,000 years, God's people, his covenant people, had been the descendants of Abraham. Gentiles could come into the covenant as proselytes. I mean, we know of some like Ruth and Rahab, and there would have been many others. But they had to become as Jews. The males had to be circumcised. Everyone had to keep kosher. They had to follow the laws of Leviticus 11. They had to observe the law of Moses. What's happening here is radical in that he is saying as Gentiles, remaining Gentiles, you know, you, your customs are different. You know, you eat different foods. Remember the vision of chapter 10? The thing like a sheet let down with the different animals? You don't have to become Jews. You just have to become Christians. Disciples of Jesus. And you can be saved. And I'll tell you, this is such a radical change that it, it, it's a struggle. But in the 15th chapter, when some are wanting to bind the law of Moses on Gentile believers... What does Peter have to say about it? Chapter 15 and verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. What matter? Verse 5. It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. You know, I am, I'm confident. I, I say, or I'll say this. I'm reasonably confident these Jewish believers who were from the sect of the Pharisees who were saying this thought they were being pretty gracious. We're willing to accept these Gentiles into our, our fold, but they've just got to become like us. You know, they've got to be circumcised. They've got to keep the law the way we do. But hey, we got nothing against Gentiles. You know, they can, they can be a part of us as long as they act just like us. There one, well, Peter is answering this. And here's his verse 7. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, Acknowledge them by giving them the Holy Spirit, 
just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? For we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Verse 7 starts off with something that, I, I don't know, it's still, after all these years of studying this and reading this, I still find a little bit shocking after much dispute. How could they dispute this? How could there, you know, okay, the, a few people got out of line, said some things they shouldn't have said. You would have thought the apostles, the elders, the, ch the church as a whole would have immediately squelched this. But quite obviously, there were those who were arguing strongly that the Gentiles had to be circumcised. They had to keep the law. What's Peter's answer? He probably didn't say the word y'all. I was about to say, y'all remember. Um, but uh, he said, you remember that I was sent to the house of Cornelius. And you remember God sent the Spirit. What happened in Acts, 11, or Acts 10, rather, it wasn't the kind of thing that happened all the time. Don't miss what's said in chapter 11 and verse 15. Peter said, the Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. This kind of miraculous outpouring of the Spirit, it didn't happen every time Peter stood up and preached. You know, he, he didn't say, as y'all have witnessed a hundred times, this was like way back at the beginning. It didn't happen every time. But that one time was the proof that God had opened the door to the Gentiles. And that's what I want us to bring out of this. I got two, two major points I want us to take home with us, live them. See God's love for all. They get back to Jerusalem. I say they, Peter. And there were six brethren that had gone with him from Joppa up to Caesarea. And it says in verse 2, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. And then Peter, with a fair amount of detail repeats exactly what we just read in chapter 10. Why does he have to do that? They had to see what he had seen. Verse 18 of the 11th chapter, that God has granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. They had to see what he had said in chapter 10 and verse 34. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. Verse 28, God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter had to tell that so they would get it. But for the moment, I want to focus on, do I get it? Do I realize... Do you realize the significance of that event for you personally? Unless you are, and I'm not aware of anyone here who is Jewish. What happened at the house of Cornelius that day was God's forever demonstration that he was reaching beyond the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That his salvation is for us. It didn't mean that Cornelius and his house didn't have to be baptized in order to be saved. It meant they could be baptized in order to be saved. That they could do the very same things the Jews had done. Repent and be baptized. And they would receive the remission of sins. This is the message for us. I can read in John 3, 16 that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, who is included in that whoever? God sent the Holy Spirit upon those Gentiles at the house of Cornelius to say, whoever is whomever. It's all God's people, all God's creatures. We were included in that. The gospel is for us. But I also want us to realize we need to show God's love to all. It is, I guess it's one of those, you read it as a younger person and you don't catch it. You get a little older and you're, you're struck by the fact that when he gets back, those of the circumcision contended with him saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. The criticism is not. Or you baptized them. You associated with them. You didn't require them, you know, to be circumcised and, you know, keep the laws of Leviticus 11. You just went in there and started associating with these people. You know, he says, yes, I did. And he told them about that vision he had seen. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Happened three times. And he said, from that I gathered I wasn't supposed to call anyone common or unclean. And I perceive that God shows no partiality. And let's give these people credit in verse 18. When they heard these things, they became silent. They stopped there contending, but they didn't remain silent. And they glorified God saying, then God also has granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. They accepted and rejoiced that God's love was for all. But when you've got something that's gone on for 2,000 years, a separation that has existed, you know, warnings, don't marry these Women of Canaan, don't give your sons to their daughters. You know, stay separate. Don't dare touch these foods. Sometimes it takes a while for people to readjust their thinking the way it ought to be. That's why in chapter 15, you had those men come up from Judea to Antioch and begin to say, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. It's not enough that you're baptized into Christ and that you're gathering with the saints on the first day of the week and that you're living the moral life that God had set forth. He said, you're going to have to be Jewish proselytes. And that's why they went to Jerusalem and the answer was no. In Galatians, the second chapter, Paul tells about an occurrence that happened. And there's some question about whether this happened before Acts 15 or after Acts 15. But it talks about how that men like Peter and Barnabas, men who knew better, they felt a pressure when some folks came up from Judea and they withdrew from the Gentiles and would no longer eat with them, wouldn't associate with them. There are very few letters of the New Testament that don't have some reference to the struggles they had over this issue. It it took a while. And here we are 2,000 years later and we have that vision shown to Peter. We've got the statements he made to Cornelius. You know, I'm not to call anyone common or unclean. God shows no partiality. Jesus is Lord of all. Whoever believes on him. We've got all of these things. Numerous other New Testament passages. And the observation that was made more than 50 years ago that at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America remains true. You know, 
it may have diminished slightly, but at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, America is probably its most divided by race it will be throughout the week. And I think we all know that's not the way it ought to be. How, how do we change that? How does it change? It was a struggle in the first century. It's not going to happen overnight in the 21st century. But a few things we can all try to do. First, we need to eliminate all racism from our hearts. All thoughts of, you know, white supremacy or whatever racism we have. And let me challenge us to realize that sometimes we can be racist without thinking we're racist. Because we're not, in, I mean, we've gone way beyond the point where we would lynch anybody. But I'll tell a little story about, it has nothing to do with race, but how I was made to feel one time. It was several years ago. I'd gone out of town to do a wedding, and you know, I guess at the time I'd been preaching 20, 25 years, something along that line. And on the Wednesday night before the wedding, I'm at worship and the preacher there, he said, so, so you're, you're the one doing the wedding? I said, yeah. He said, he looked at me, he smiled, and he said, I know you'll do fine. You know, it was just like, you know, you're not nearly up at my level, but, but you'll be okay. You know, you'll, you know I, I mean, I honestly, at the moment he was saying it, I thought, do you want to pat me on the head while you say that, you know? Because you're treating me like a little child that you're trying to reassure you'll be okay. Do we sometimes treat people of other races and other cultures as, oh, we wouldn't want to hurt them, but we feel a certain superiority. We're patronizing. We're condescending toward them. Let's not be that. And one of the greatest challenges, look, sometimes we struggle. Let's be honest. You know, white people in the South struggle to accept the culture of white people from the North. We think they are strange. And we want them, you know, the moment they cross the line to start acting like Southerners. You know, quit putting sugar on their grits, you know. Um, you know, some things, you know. How much more do we sometimes expect it's okay to be black as long as you don't act black or Hispanic or, and sometimes just some other country. We need to do, and, I, I, and this is me too, a better job of distinguish, distinguish, yeah, there you go, thank you, distinguishing between what's morally wrong and what's just simply culturally different. I think we sometimes confuse those two. One of the most important things we can do is befriend people who are different. How many times, I mean, if you've ever helped someone come to know Christ, led them to the Savior, more than likely it was someone with whom you had developed a relationship that you had a certain friendship with. We need to show God's love to all and seek to develop relationships with people. People we work with, we go to school with. Allow them into our lives. And just talk to everybody about the gospel. And I'm not talking about some social engineering project by which, well, our purpose is to integrate the church. Our purpose is to simply show God's love to all. It's to do what God wanted from the beginning, that his gospel go to every creature, that I be 
more about, well, going back to the parable of the sower. It's, been, I, it's not original with me, but somebody said years ago, instead of sowing the seed, we tend to want to run soil samples. You know, in farming and gardening, sometimes you realize, I mean, that's a smart thing to do. Find the right place to plant. When it comes to the gospel, I don't know what the soil is like. Just sow the seed. You know, let it fall. And then welcome those who are different. If someone comes into our assembly and they look different from us, if they have a different accent, maybe they dress differently, be welcoming. Be welcoming. When I see my New Testament, I, you know, I, again, as I said in Acts 15, I think, how could there be much dispute over this? God had made it pretty clear. The words of Jesus, the actions of the Spirit at the house of Cornelius, the teaching of the apostles, and yet there was much dispute. And it continued to be an issue in various churches. It's not always easy to overcome, but it must be something we strive to do. The fact that something's not easy doesn't give us an excuse not to do it. When I look at the house of Cornelius, I ought to stand amazed that God loved me. You know, it's sometimes hard for us to appreciate the fact that if we could take ourselves and go back in time 2,000 years, we were the outsiders. We were the ones that God's covenant people look down upon. You know, be amazed at that love. The words amazing grace truly ought to stick with us. But let's also realize it wasn't just us. It's a lot of people that don't look like us that are included too. In conclusion, invitation. What happened that day is the Holy Spirit was announcing the door of salvation was open to all. But there's a phrase there in verse 18, repentance to life. It doesn't matter what part of the world you live in, what language you speak, what color your skin is. God loves you, but he also expects you to repent, to turn to him. And this morning, if there is anyone who needs to do that, and we can help, you come while we stand, while we sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.